Hello, thanks for joining us today. Um, we This is the last um, webcast in our Pond webcast series. This is the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance that is sponsoring this. So this is part four, uh, Ponds and the Municipal uh, Perspective. And we are, um, my name is Seth Brown. And uh, thanks for everybody joining us today uh, for this this presentation. We've got a lot of great speakers, and uh, we're going to have a lot of opportunity for interaction today. So hopefully you guys um, will will join us. All right. So um, how we're going to ro roll through today, um, we're first going to do an overview and uh, an introduction opening. I'm going to talk about the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance. For those who are not familiar, I'll do a quick um, overview of that, of our organization. And then I'll talk about something that we put together related to um, the topic here of ponds. Uh, we put together a draft stormwater pond decision framework, and hopefully we'll get into that a little bit as we go along. But I'll I'll go through that quickly to talk about what, what that's about. And then uh, then we'll have some, some presentations from folks that are, uh, some that you, some that you see, some that you don't um, on the on the screen here. Uh, we'll we'll have a perspective from here. I'm in the Washington D.C. area, so we'll have a perspective from uh, Chesterfield County, Virginia, which is just uh, outside of Richmond, and then we'll hear about what's going on in Austin, Texas, and then we'll have a chance to um, address questions and and answers and whatnot. And then we're going to have a lot of time for a facilitated discussion about these topics with, with the folks, the panelists, as well as some uh, some other folks that are joining us here. And then we'll have another opportunity for, for Q&A and then we'll wrap up. So uh, we're planning on going from right now, one o'clock until about three o'clock. We shouldn't go any later than that. And if we end up early, then um, that'll be okay too. So uh, the speakers today will have Scott Smedley with Chesterfield County. Uh, he is not, uh, his webcam is not working, so he's not gonna be, uh, you can't see his face, but he's here in, uh, in mind and spirit in all other ways. We'll have Lee Sherman with the city of Austin. Um, you can see him on your screen, bearded and ready to go. And uh, Dave Smith, the EPA Region 9, uh, uh, out, out on the West Coast, and then Trey Shanks with Freeze and Nichols. And again, my name is, uh, Seth Brown. So that's the uh, that's the folks will be talking today. Um, again, I mentioned that this is a four part uh, webcast series. This is the last focusing on the municipal perspective. Um, this uh, all this information in this webcast series has been brought to you to you uh, from the uh, support from the Chesapeake Bay Trust. Uh, we've received a grant to cover. Issue, all sorts of issues related to the stormwater sector. And uh, ponds are clearly uh, one of, of great interest to the Chesapeake Bay as well as the nation. So uh, that's the, the focus here. There are free recordings available for the previous three webcasts as well as other webcasts that NAMSA has um, led and sponsored. And those webcasts are available at the link you see there, tinyurl.com um, slash NAMSA webcasts. And um, you can receive these um, PDF of these slides, and um, you can get that link as you want. So you can check that out or email me if you have any questions on that. A couple of housekeeping items uh, real quickly. First is that we are recording this webcast. Again, that will be made available at that same URL. Uh, probably take about 24 hours for all that to be processed. So just as an FYI on that. Uh, so if you have to duck out halfway through or whatever, then you can see the rest of this uh, webcast. Um, PDF of these slides will also be made available based upon requests for all the folks here that are presenting. So all this information you should be able to get. Um, and also, if you have any, uh, if there's a need for PDHs, a certification for, or for or, or, I'm sorry, certificate for PDHs, just let me know, and I'll send those to you. Uh, we'll have, assuming we go close to two hours on this, then we'll have two um, PDHs for this. And also, you, um, since we're in a webcast um, context here. Those who are attending here cannot speak, so the way to um, provide input is through the question in, uh, box. So if you have any questions, um, please use that question box. I will be kind of reviewing these and facilitating all of that as the speakers are going along. Um, so please use that. We do would love to have a lot of questions that come in, um, and if there's some questions that we can't get to, then we'll try to get to them after um, after the uh, the webcast. So if we don't get to everything, um, please don't be uh, too bummed out. We'll get to it. 
Um, and if you have any problems with the audio or something's not working, just let us know through the chat function. I'll try to keep an eye on that as we go along too. So that's uh, that's the housekeeping stuff. Um, so I'm going to to, to go over um, uh, NAMSA and and the then the the Pond Decision Framework, and um, and we're gonna just kind of walk through this, and then we'll have a poll, and then we'll get kick off with the, the panelists at that point. So. Um, I'm assuming that everybody on the call or on the web, on the webcast um, is aware of the National Municipal Stormwater Alliance. So I did want to give some context on that um, for because we're only about two years old. We were uh, informally established in 2016. We were formally established by um, as a 501c3 in 2018. So we're relatively new, <clears throat> but we're a coalition or an alliance. We're an organization of organizations. Uh, so we're not, we don't have individuals as members. We have individuals that are representatives of organizations across the, the country. And, and our, we've got two types of members. Primarily, we've got state or regional coalitions. So um, California Stormwater Quality Association, for instance, is one of our founding members. Um, Minnesota City Stormwater Coalition, those type of um, entities that, that represent the MS4s uh, specifically. And we also have affiliate members. Those are everybody else. So they're consultants, practitioners, and whatnot. So um, we also just changed our bylaws to allow single MS4s. Um, that's not completely um, uh, approved yet, but I think it will be approved shortly. Um, so we might have large MS4s that, that join on uh, specifically themselves. Um, otherwise, we normally ask for coalitions that represent five or more MS4s in a state or region. So the goal here is to bring together a national network <clears throat> of state and regional MS4 uh, affiliated organizations. Um, so that's that's really what we are and, and what we're about. The motivation for the formation is really we want to develop this network in a unified voice um, for the MS4 sector. We feel like historically we've been somewhat and not at the table. We've been reactive. We've not been out front trying to drive things. So we're trying to be proactive where we can be um, on policy issues, for instance, or other other uh, similar types of uh, uh, dynamics related to the stormwater and the MS4 sector. We also need to be reactive because um, things pop up all the time. So we're trying to be able to, to drive the discussion and also react to what's going on. Um, again, we want to connect and unite the MS4s across the country, provide peer-to-peer uh, support and, and information transfer um, between either state organizations, regional regional organizations, or MS4s themselves. So really we're here to focus on the MS4 um, uh, programs and try to elevate as much as we can on that on that side. Also we're trying to do things like promoting stormwater as a resource, put in the, increase the, the public image of stormwater, and um, talk about the multiple benefits and multiple uses of, of, of uh, stormwater projects. Uh, so we're just trying to raise the level of awareness generally for stormwater overall. Um, the vision is very simple. We want to help to provide clean water for the nation. Um, so that's obviously an audacious goal, but there are many organizations focused on this goal. We just want to be another one of those that are focusing on on this specific issue of stormwater run, urban stormwater runoff specifically. And we feel like we can uh, address this vision by um, helping to, uh, to MS4 programs to be um, efficient and effective uh, programs and to base all decisions as much as we can on science and information. So that's where we're coming from um, in terms of uh, of our vision. And we have four major action areas. There's a lot that we can get into in the details here, but that's not the purpose here. But I did want to give some context. Again, the first and foremost, we want to provide sector support. So provides uh, provide MS4 uh, focused and oriented organizations and MS4s themselves with information that's helpful to them uh, to meet their goals and their needs to address uh, urban runoff. Uh, we also are focused a lot on messaging and communication, and we want to raise awareness of stormwater, um, both on maybe on Capitol Hill, with an EPA at, at the state level too, um, at the local level as well. So that's such a key part of MS4 and stormwater programs that we. Um, we're really focused on on that aspect. Um, we're in 501c3 organizations and nonprofits are um, specifically 501c3s are based upon education. So we want to disseminate technical information and um, as well as policy and advocacy information. Um, and we want to get that out to the sector. We also want to be able to provide a communication channel back up to the national level as well. 
to help again drive that discussion um, at, at the national level. And lastly, um, policy and advocacy. There's just a lot going on in this space, <clears throat> so we, we're very active both on, on, um, on Congress in, in Congress and Capitol Hill, and uh, with EPA. And we've got a very strong, positive relationship with EPA, um, both at the national level and at the regional level as well. Um, real quickly to talk about who's um, part of NAMSA, we have at this point 22 states where this is increasing all the time. Uh, and then so the states that are listed there in blue are our member or, or state organizations. And those the, the plus signs are states that we have some type of engagement uh, to potentially add, add those states to the mix as well. We're probably going to hopefully have by about half the country we reach a threshold of 25 in the near future. <clears throat> That's our goal. But So we're in conversation with several other states, as you can see, and we do have, as, my, as I mentioned, affiliate members, about 10 of those right now. And again, that ro roster is growing. So if there's anybody that um, that you know of that, that um, you know, is in a state that's not that's not shown in blue here, please let me know if you're if you're in an organization or know of an organization that we should be aware of and that we should follow up with. It's very easy and cheap to join. Um, we're not trying to make costs a threshold um, at this point. Um, same thing with affiliate members. We're always looking for affiliate support. And again, that's relatively inexpensive. So, and this is our leadership. Um, you can see Scott Taylor is with California Stormwater Quality uh, Association. He's our chair, Randy Nieprash, who was going to be with us today, but he had a conflict. He represents the Minnesota City Stormwater Coalition. He's the vice chair, and we've got Jennifer Watson, who's the treasurer. She uh, represents the Tennessee Stormwater Association. And I'm the executive director, as you can see there. So, and that's all of our contact information. If you have any questions, let us know. And uh, you can visit our website at the, the, the URL that's listed there again, or just always let, let me know if there's any questions. So I will then um, now get onto the, um, our, our proposed stormwater uh, pond decision framework. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time. Uh, actually, all this information is available to you in the handouts area of your um, GoToWebinar uh, app. Uh, so if you look, go to the handouts area, you can, um, there's, a, there's a PDF there that you click on that, it opens up something like a browser, you can just download that. Um, but I did want to, to walk through this a little bit to set the stage for what we're, what we're talking about here. So why are we focusing on ponds? Well, it's, you know, it's, it's really the first, um, the first and most ubiquitous BMP that's out there. So if we can make um, an impact on, on, on this, you know, type of BMP, that's something that is very significant. Um, we also see that ponds, there's, you know, there's millions, thousands, or maybe millions of them across the U.S., depending on, on how you estimate this. And many are aging. Many have been, were built maybe 20, 30 years ago. That might be the, you know, the, the design life of many of these facilities. And many haven't been well maintained. So aging infrastructure is a, is a, is a large um, uh, issue for not just the stormwater sector, but other infrastructure sectors. But it's becoming more and more critical. We're maturing as a sector, and this is one of the early BMPs that are seeing, starting to see um, this aging infrastructure dynamic. The other thing is that many, just like most, a lot of stormwater infrastructure, a lot of these facilities are on private properties as well as public right away. That creates a different dynamic and um, some, something that we need to consider. It's a little bit different than other infrastructure sectors too. So um, in this webcast series, we've addressed uh, problems with ponds. So we've looked at research about um, the exporting of uh, phosphorus, for instance, in some facilities um, that are not well mixed, as an example. Um, so I, you know, go out and check that, uh, the, the problem with ponds webcast to see that, as well as toxics in, in, in dredge material. Um, we also looked at asset management as a, as a larger topic. We're going to talk about that some today as well. Um, that's so. If you check up on uh, as assets that webcast, you can uh, catch out catch more information on that. And then last, the last series we, we the, or the last webcast was on uh, technologies that can be used to correct pond um, problems as well as address uh, pond enhancements and try to open up uh, opportunities uh, through technology for enhanced performance. What we want to focus on today is <clears throat> looking at, from the municipal perspective, planning and prioritizing, implementing, financing, and investing on, um, on ponds specifically. So that's really the focus of today. That's the, the backdrop of this pond decision framework, and we're looking for you to provide input on this. This is a this is a, a product that NAMSA is tr is trying to we put together this draft version to get uh, input from the sector, 
Um, and we want to finalize that after we're done with all of these these um, webcasts that we've had and then all the outreach that we've had. We're getting, we're receiving input and we want to finalize this and make it available as a free product on our website. It's not meant to be, you know, be all end all, but it's supposed to be something that MS4 program managers can potentially use in their um, uh, in their work to try to start, you know, if they're thinking about, hey, ponds are a big issue for us, we want to start doing something about that. This can at least provide a starting point. Um, that's that's the, the 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 point. So this is a 1.0, and we're looking for input from folks. The framework that you know, there's a lot of different frameworks out there. What we pulled together was kind of a hybrid based upon what's available free uh, from EPA under the fundament, fundamentals of asset management, uh, and and we can provide the back. You know, if there's any questions about these sources, as well as some uh, information that Trey Shanks, who's on this, we're lucky to have on this uh, webcast today, uh, put together. So there's a little bit of a hybrid of both. But we looked at framework steps that are you know seven different steps that are listed here i'm going to quickly go through these I'm not going to spend a lot of time again because you hopefully you can do this on your own and um and provide uh feedback to us but the first step would be of course getting an inventory of your assets you know look at um at, at the data that's associated with the number of ponds the location of ponds this is something that's normally done as a matter of course in a lot of ms4 programs to meet permit requirements um, but really focusing on 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 ponds in this context and we also want to think about where are, what are the common problems and enhancement opportunities in our area uh, that might be obviously those would be different in an arid climate probably than um, than in a, not in an arid climate you know as an example. So once the initial asset inventory is um, effort is done, then uh, the next step would be to determine the status of um, of of the ponds and and the assets and the um, the first way to do that is to establish pro pond program goals, and that might vary based upon what's going on. If you've got sensitive water bodies or TMDLs in some portion of your of your uh, MS4 and not others, that might drive how you would um, establish your pond uh, program goals, as an example. And um, we also have a specific um, different types of categorizations that we're thinking about in the context of the status of ponds, and we just have some examples here. Some some categories could be that you've got complete physical failure or performance failure, and you could have a mix of both, or you could have everything's in great shape. We have a note down here, the way that we're trying to promote this, this approach is that there's ponds that aren't performing, so those are ponds that need to be corrected in order to, so if a pond's 10 years old, it doesn't mean it's gonna work the same way as a, something that's newly built potentially, but it should work you know, at a certain level of expectation that, that needs to be determined. And you shouldn't and try to look any kind of pond enhancements if you unless before you can get to that pond correction. So first you have to correct and then you can enhance. That's what we're talking about here in this these different categories. Uh, then think in the context of asset management, and we're we'll, going to hear about this from I think both um, Lee is going to talk about this, and I think Trey can can probably elaborate on this as well. Um, but this is just a, a, a generic general approach to asset management, which is doing a condition and criticality rating analysis. And really that comes down to when you're reviewing all of your assets in, in this in this aspect or in this context, ponds, you ask yourself two questions. First of all, you know, not just what, you know, what condition uh, is, are your ponds in, but what's the consequences of, of any kind of failure related to problems and the status of, of that pond? And then what's the second question is what's the probability? So how likely is it to fail? And if it does fail, how impactful will it be? That helps us to understand, you know, really what um, what the risk is for risk profile for our um, assets. And this is again, this is taken from Trey uh, Shanks. And this is, you know, you could on, on the on the on the x-axis you've got the, or on this matrix of probability of failure. So this is the condition, and on the the y you have the criticality. So you want to look for those um, situations that are that are poor condition, and if they do fail, they have very high impact. So you have a failure of an embankment, floods out uh, downstream property as an example. Um, that helps us identify what's the highest risk. We wanna address those first. So this is a prioritization um, approach. And then we wanna think about the costs. So in this, in this uh, context, we wanna look at if we need to correct first. So we've got problems out there. We find those that are of the highest risk level. So we've got uh, risk across the top here. 
we got high risk and we find out that um, we can come up with some uh, ways to address the issues and it's relatively low, then that's the highest priority for for um, to take some action. So it's not just a risk, but it's also what's the cost associated with that. So this is one another way to start thinking about um, uh, investment. You know, how much do you actually have to invest? Another, another um, dimension of this is not just looking at what needs to be corrected, but how can we enhance our pond's performance to maybe generate credits that we can use for offsets or trading or something like that? So again, it's the same type of thing. If we've got a high potential for benefits, um, for enhancements, and the costs are relatively low, that's a number one. That's something that's a, that's a good opportunity for um, an enhancement. So this is that's a, a way to prioritize and, and understand what your opportunities are out there. Then you can start to plan um, and implement. And we and we're talking about again um, putting all this together into a larger context, not just looking at each one. Uh, obviously, and then start balancing between your costs and risk opportunities. And that's what this analysis has, has um, really highlighted as an example. Um, and these are things that, you know, you have to think about what's existing and also maybe what's going in the future too. So you might have some that are going to be planned in the future as well, new uh, assets as well. And then you can start to think about funding, uh, seeking funding opportunities. And I think asset management is one of those things that can help to do that. It's one of the benefits, um, and we'll talk about that. And maybe we, if you've got a, uh, you're in, a, in an area where you can have market-based approaches for credit trading or offsets or whatever, then you can start to plan for that um, once you get to this point. And again, I think O&M is something that's been neglected. That really needs to be included in this. So these are just some basic steps that that we put that, that we threw out there as a starting point. Um, we know that there's other there's other ways to to do this. There's a, a flowchart example. This is from Kitsap County. In Washington, they've got 600 pounds, 300 that they have to manage in their um, jurisdiction. <clears throat> and if you follow this flow chart, it's kind of similar to what, what I laid out here. It's just a different way of doing it. So we know that this is another way of doing it, uh, of kind of laying out how do you take, how do you plan, prioritize, and take some action. This is another example from EPA Region 1, uh, focused on uh, retrofits generally for not just ponds, but for um, stormwater BMPs uh, looking in the Massachusetts and New Hampshire area. And this is a step-by-step -step kind of progression, looking at desktop analysis and field and then inventory. It's, it's kind of similar, but it's a little bit of a, of a difference. So the point is that we know that there's others that are out there. We've developed a series of questions. We're not gonna go over this right now, but again, um, hoping that you can take a look at this and we, you can provide input to us in written form, um, and, you know, as, as to help us understand what's most useful to to you so the question is what to do now again download the document in the uh, handouts area and if you can't if that doesn't work for you, you can't figure that out just let me know email me at seth.brown at national stormwater alliance.org and i'll get that information to you would love to get your thoughts and if you can email them to me with the the the, the subject header um and in your email it says comments on pond decision framework that way i can organize it better um, we will utilize this input to finalize this framework and then we'll make this available um to for free so now we're going to move on to the panel, uh, the panelists. So I just wanted to set the stage, provide some context um, on where we're coming from and what we're trying to get out of this. Before we get into this, I did want to um, pause for a second and ask folks who are joining us today um, what your background um, is. So we're going to launch this poll. And um, we're asking you what your uh, professional background and affiliation is. So we're gonna have a, two more of these polls. We'll ask you to, to engage if you can. Um, and we're gonna wait till we get some uh, certain amount of responses that then, uh, then we, can, uh, uh, we can move along. So we've seen some people that are uh, jumping in. We are, are um, ideally, we're trying to, to reach that the top uh, as many of the folks in that in that top heading as air as possible, the stormwater program manager area. That's really what our focus is. Um, nothing against um, uh, the other the other affiliations and backgrounds, but um, our our the whole goal of NAMSA is to try to address as many of the folks that are um, in that top area as possible. So um, we've got about close to seventy five yep seventy five folks uh, percentage of folks that are out there. <clears throat> have answered, so I appreciate that. So I'm going to close this poll and I'm going to share it. You can see the results here. 
And it looks like um, indeed we are reaching a, a majority of our audience today is uh, stormwater program managers, which is great because that's really what we're trying to um, to get information out to. So appreciate you making time today uh, and sharing uh, this input. Again, we're going to have two more of these polls that are going to be um, launched um, as we go along, one after each presentation. So, so with that in mind, um, I wanted to uh, introduce first uh, Scott Smedley. He's with Chesterfield County, Virginia. And again, he doesn't have, you won't see his his uh, his face um, right now, but he's, he's definitely here. And uh, he's gonna be talking about stormwater facility pond maintenance and pond retrofits in, in his community. So Scott, if you're ready, I can, uh, I'll share the screen with you. Yep, go ahead. All right. And let me know if there's any uh, anything you need from me. All right, thank you, Seth. Well, yeah, uh, and just if you could if you could flip those uh, the display uh, settings on that, then I think that'll be the we'll be able to see more details. Perfect. All right, thank you. There we go. Yep. So as Seth mentioned. Um, I'm Scott Smedley. I'm the Director of Environmental Engineering here in Chesterfield County. Uh, we perform many of the similar functions of other public works departments uh, and we'll focus on our stormwater activities today. So we are located in Central Virginia. We have a population of roughly 350,000 and we've been a Phase 1 MS4 since about 1995. The county took over a majority of residential BMP maintenance back in 2001 due to several BMP failures uh, caused by a lack of maintenance by HOAs. Uh, this is a picture of a private pond uh, dam failure back in 2014. We currently maintain a little over 500 stormwater BMPs. We were right at 497 about three months ago, so I'm pretty sure we're over 500 right now. The development economy here in Chesterfield has been really strong. Basically, we're back to the uh, pre-recession development level of um, housing and building permits. We maintain a little over 300 stormwater ponds, and then we also ensure the maintenance of approximately 600 private BMPs. Uh, we go out every year, do our annual inspections, and do regular maintenance on um, all of the stormwater ponds and BMPs that we maintain. And then we send out mailers and follow-up uh, inspections for the private BMPs. One of our biggest challenges now, uh, we have a, a fairly robust um, asset management system on the BMP side, but so much of our time is spent dealing with citizens who live next to these stormwater ponds that were often built as quasi amenities for the community by the developer. And since we are maintaining them, the citizens and residents feel like that the pond needs to be maintained in a pristine aquatic condition. And it's very difficult to convey to these HOAs and these residents that these are stormwater pollution treatment devices and that they're gonna have algal blooms and they're not gonna look like a pristine clear body of water. So that, uh, in the summertime during the high heat and you know runoff uh, high runoff days it's um it's very challenging to deal with the public on that so as seth mentioned we're in the chesapeake bay watershed and as part of that the chesapeake bay has a tmdl total maximum daily load to reduce nitrogen phosphorus and sediment loadings to the chesapeake bay so we received our uh, Bay TMDL requirements in our permit in 2014. And in preparation for that, we started putting together our plan 
for how we're going to meet those nutrient reduction goals. And one of the things that came out of our evaluation and study was that stream restoration was most often the best bang for the buck. So as we were looking to spend tens of millions of dollars and well over a hundred million dollars, you know, spending that money wisely was most important to our elected officials and stream restoration became our number one priority for meeting those reduction goals. And as we identified projects, stream restoration projects made up the, the biggest chunk of that. But as we moved into some of the first projects we did, the challenges started to become even bigger than what we expected. And this photo here is from one of the first projects we did on a county park land that was located right next to a residential subdivision. So we got a, a decent amount of drainage area and good credit for the project. But even though it was on county land, the stream boundary was right next to the park and residential property and many of the residents had migrated their rear backyards onto the park property with swing sets, sheds, structures, clearing, grass cutting and all of a sudden we were coming in to do our project and even though it was on county land the challenges we encountered because they had encroached with their personal property onto the park property became pretty significant. And then as some of my comrades around the state have started to realize too, when you start interacting with more and more of the residents to get these projects done, the, the pushback can sometimes seem you know, quite astounding that people are upset that you're gonna come in and try to you know, do environmental revitalization on a stream that's in their backyard. So it became more and more challenging for all of us as stream restoration projects started to encounter this pushback. And what we're finding more and more is that, you know, even though we were coming in to do something environmentally beneficial, nobody wanted it in their backyard. It was okay, it was great if you were gonna do it on the neighborhood, neighborhood a couple blocks down, but don't do it in my backyard. So we have a project that we just went out to uh, notice to proceed on construction, a stream restoration project that we started in 2014. And because we had 40 some easements we needed to acquire, it took forever. And a lot of those uh, people no longer lived in those homes, but rented them out. They lived out of state. And something that we thought we would have had done three years ago, we're just starting construction this month. So le that left us with thinking, all right, we've got to find some other good alternatives that are going to give us the nutrient reductions that we're looking for. So here we are. We started looking at some of the older facilities that we had for BMPs, and we took over maintenance of the school stormwater facilities around 2012. And it was the same type of situation where the BMPs hadn't been maintained very well, and we ended up having to go in and do some repairs for them, and then a deal was worked out between the uh, schools and the county side to take over maintenance for them. So this candidate here, you see a picture of, I'm gonna talk about a little bit later on, but it was like, this is a no brainer. It's all on county property. We can go in, we can do a retrofit, we can make significant improvements and get really good nutrient reductions before it discharges almost directly into the James River. So 
we pulled back on our plan a little bit and started looking at BMP retrofits a little harder. In our first assessment, they were more expensive than the stream restoration projects, but after we got into some of the roadblocks and hurdles with the stream restoration, contract prices going up because everybody in the state was looking at stream restoration, BMP retrofits became a more attractive alternative. So we looked at, you know, types of BMPs we had and the pond retrofits, since the majority of our BMPs are ponds, uh, some of the guidance that's out there from the state and EPA, and then trying to maximize our pollutant removal credits. And then I'll cover some of the lessons learned and conclusions. So as Seth mentioned, failing BMPs, age and or maintenance, you know, playing a factor in those, going in and doing those enhancements for pollutant removal, possibly protecting from downstream erosion. I think if, um, if you're on the East Coast and even some of you on the West Coast or in Texas, you know, some of the extreme storm events that we've all had have really created, you know, significant erosion issues. Um, and then potentially adding some flood protection for downstream properties. So these next set of photos are all from private BMPs that we've dealt with over the last several years. And on the left-hand side, that's actually the dam. And you can see all the vegetation that has grown up on that dam and the potential for any of those trees to go down and rip out a big chunk of the dam. Congested clogged spillways. This is a photo from earlier where we had a failure of the impoundment because of one of the drain pipes running through had rusted out and corroded and then, you know, basically collapsed that section of the dam. Once again, a deteriorated spillway. So some of the types of retrofits, um, taking an old wet pond, and some of this terminology is, is kind of specific to Virginia, but upgrading it to a wet pond level one or level two, in our case, uh, taking an old dry pond and creating a constructed wetland, or taking an old constructed wetland and converting it to a wet pond level one or two, taking an old dry pond, converting it to a filtering practice where you're actually getting some infiltration or taking an old flood control stormwater management facility and you know, upgrading that to get some water quality benefit in a wet pond. So here in Virginia, we have a, like I like to say, a smorgasbord of conversion choices. This is taken from some of our guidance documents about all the different types. Um, so, you know, as we were looking at all of our BMPs, looking at the site constraints, you know, funding is obviously an option for a lot of us. And then also, what are our final retrofit goals? So here in uh, Virginia, we have a Department of Environmental Quality. They have a guidance document that lays out basically the, the parameters or the rules that we get to play by for these conversions. And basically what you have to do is you look at um, what you're going to restore that BMP to, what the efficiency is, and you subtract what the existing BMP efficiency is based on missing design elements, uh, whether it was undersized um, and so forth. And you end up with your final incremental efficiency improvement. And then you can calculate, you know, your cost per pound and is it going to be cost effective? And if it is, well, that's great. And if it's not, then well, that kind of sucks and you gotta go back to the drawing board and, and look at another one. So some of the factors impacting efficiency, the selection of the retrofit type, 
Um, as you get into uh, more expensive BMP types, such as filtering practices, uh, your costs may go up. Uh, most often, you know, the, the ponds are the cheapest. Uh, you get into the wetlands and filtering practices and the costs start going up. The drainage area controlled by the retrofit, obviously a developed drainage area is going to give you your biggest bang for the buck of nutrient reduction. If a lot of your drainage area is forested or an open space, then you're not going to get much reduction there. Uh, your topography, the soils, do you have a high groundwater table that's going to start to limit some of your options? Um, can you get some of the uh, uh, all of the parameters or the specifications designed into your site layout? If you can't, then that's going to start to knock down some of your options. So here is the school site that I was mentioning. The areas in red are outlined where the current uh, or past BMPs were and where we went in and did some retrofits. Um, the one on the bottom was just a dry detention basin. And then the two on the top or at the back of the school were uh, kind of like wet ponds. One of them was more of a, a wet marshy bottom. So this is the, the one I was mentioning that was basically a dry detention basin. And we converted that to a constructed wetland. And this is during the initial planting, during a low flow. This is a good picture that shows the low flow channel. And uh, all of these wetland plants are in very well established now, and you can't even see that low flow channel. But this one worked out really well. And in actuality, the contractor ended up um, excavating more soil out of here than they needed to. So we ended up getting a little extra volume out of this one too, which was an added benefit. This is one in the rear, one of the ponds, kind of in the middle of that previous photo. And you can see this is the before picture where it had really filled in over time. The vegetation that uh, was in there when we took over, there was a lot of standing trees, large diameter trees that we had to clear out. But you can see the amount of soil deposition and sediment that accumulated over time particularly with those trees in there that helped to trap a lot of that. So we went back in and uh, built a full scale uh, level two wet pond, the four bay in the front here. And then in, in the rear, there's a solar um, aeration to provide aeration during um, part of the day. And during the other part of the day, the solar panels are charging. So some of the challenges that we had as we were moving through the design on this one, even though it was on school property, um, that pond that I just showed you was right next to one of the football practice fields. And so we had to you know, reorient some of the design there so we weren't going to be in, impacting that and didn't want to lose any buy-in from the schools. Um, some of the drainage areas that, you know, we had on the plants from when these facilities were originally designed and built, which was back, the design was back in the late 80s, it was built in the early 90s, some of that uh, drainage area had changed, so um, it actually was a benefit for us because of the amount of uh, imperviousness that had increased, but we couldn't rely on what was previously on the plans for these facilities, we had to go back and remap all that. Um, and then one of the ponds, there was no outlet structure information on the original plan. So we had to do an additional survey of what was constructed out there. So those were some of the challenges. Um, you know, these facilities are almost 30 years old and the standards and the design requirements back then weren't quite as stringent as what we've got today. Permitting was a little bit of a challenge with the Army Corps of Engineers. The one dry pond that I showed you that we converted to a wetland, that area had been classified as jurisdictional wetlands when the schools were built. And even though all the appropriate uh, permitting was done, 
when the school was built and that dry pond was built, when we submitted our permit applications, it still came back that that was a jurisdictional feature that we had to make sure we accounted for, um, which we had struggled to understand the rationale, but it ended up just delaying things a little bit and you know one other hurdle to get through. It wasn't insurmountable, but it wasn't something we expected to come up. So uh, more lessons learned, gather as much information as possible during the planning stage. Um, you know, we had assumed that everything for the current facilities was on the previous plans, but as I mentioned, one of the outlet structures wasn't on there, so that was more survey work that we had to do. Um, you know, select innovative techniques as needed. We ended up using a newer uh, storm scepter device on one of our drop inlets to help remove trash and debris before it went into the BMP, just to add another safety factor or level of treatment removal um, that we could easily clean out. Kids were always throwing uh, plastic bottles everywhere, and that storm scepter fills up really quick from uh, trash, unfortunately, in the parking lot. Um, and then looking at your entire drainage area to make sure that you're going to get the you know, most credit out of that. For us in Virginia, you know, we've got really good design guidance, and that's, you know, very beneficial. New design requirements are typically require larger footprints, so you know trying to meet some of those with the current uh, site constraints can be challenging. There's many options to consider when looking at retrofits, so uh, we've we've got a lot of options for that. And then finding the right mix to make the project cost effective is probably one of the biggest challenges. And with that, uh, thank you all for listening and participating today. All right, Scott, uh, thanks. Um, we have a quick question. Uh, someone asked what uh, BMP means best management practice. I want to clarify for folks, any kind of acronyms that are out there, you know, let us know if there's any confusion. Yes, BMP is best management practice, definitely. Um, also, um, there was uh, a question that came in that I'm just trying to capture some of these as they as they come in. On um, you, can you go back to the uh, the slide? It might be helpful um, to go back to the slide that's that talked about the kind of I um, can't remember what it was. It was looking at the um, downward. I can't remember. I think it was called the downward. Kind of like that. That um, yes, yeah, right there. Downward modification. Um, so there's two questions. The first is, does that downward modification um, include anything about, because you've talked, you've got missing design elements and then undersized BMP. So the two questions are, does, does undersized mean that's undersized in the context of uh, like climate change or, you know, new information about about that or, and, and what might be in the future as well as just you know, uh, something that's not been maintained, so it might not be missing design elements, but it might just have failing design elements that needs to be corrected before, you know, so you so you, you have to address that before you, uh, or take that into account in, when you look at the restored. So in, in, any thoughts on, on those two questions? Yeah, so the way the downward modification works is you have um, percentages that you can subtract from your existing efficiency. So let's say, you know, the BMP that was built 30 years ago, they didn't build it with a four bay. So you can subtract, um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but just let's say for sake of argument, 5% from the existing e efficiency. Um, and also if the facility was just built, um, you know, to basically be uh, detention for, you know, volume control and it wasn't factoring in any treatment, then it's probably undersized from a, a water quality standpoint. So you can subtract another 5% for that. So there's there's a list of things that you can use uh, or categorize under that downward modification criteria uh, to you know subtract from the existing BMP efficiency. Okay. 
is that is that a very clear is that a clear and easy thing to do or is that something that's a bit challenging and unclear um it's pre it's pretty specific in the design elements that you can subtract out so it's not like you can just arbitrarily make them up so to speak okay okay um another quick question uh that came in when you said when you look at uh bmps does that include the administrative bmps as well or just structural so i think they're asking about non-structural as well as structural um but only structural okay that's what i was that's what i was figuring as well um okay I, nothing else has come in question wise but i'm sure we'll have more time uh, as we as we go along to address that and we'll have more of a chance to do a q a at the end of both presentations so is there anything else to to clarify at this time or add uh scott no uh, thank you thank you for giving me the podium yep and actually there are more questions coming in so we'll we'll we'll, we'll have a chance to address that as we go along i did want to ask uh i'm going to open up another um uh, poll uh here and ask everybody to um share information we're always curious about knowing if uh the information that's being shared is something that's is that is it new or is it something that's that you're already familiar with so if you can uh let us know if this is something that's uh, the information that scott just shared is this entirely new to you is it something that's kind of kind of new relatively new or is it or is it familiar and you you understand it very well or maybe you're already implementing something like this um or maybe you're implementing something that's a different type of program but you know something that's trying to in, in the same area would really be interested in <clears throat> seeing um, again so that we want to know if this is um, you know how can I have kind of some novel uh, uh, um, quality for folks um, out there so it looks like about half yes have voted until you get if a couple more folks could could uh, chime in then we can check that out Okay, so I'm going to close this poll and I'm going to share it. And it looks like um, that very nobody says that it's entirely new. So this is something that is pretty familiar with folks. But um, a third said it's relatively new, and, and uh, over half said it's familiar and good understanding. But yet there's not been a whole lot of implementation done on this type of program or uh a different type of similar program so that's good information to have thank you for uh for sharing that information with us um so scott with that in in mind i'm going to take the the control back here and then i'm going to ask if uh our next presenter who is lee sherman with the city of austin uh if he's ready then um uh, lee if you you can you can get going and i can share the Share the screen with you if you're ready to go. I believe I'm ready to go. All right. Okay. I'm going to hand this over to you. And if you can give a little bit of background where you're coming from, Lee, and uh, when we do this, then um, as we get things going, that'd be great. Sure. Let me pull up my presentation here and make sure that I'm good to go on that front. Yep. Okay, can you see my presentation? Not right now, I can't. Show my screen, okay. How about now? <clears throat> yep, there we go. That looks perfect. Okay, great. All right, uh, thanks, so Lee. My name is Lee Sherman. I uh, work for the City of Austin Watershed Protection Department. I've been here for about 12 years, um, they're calling me the stormwater treatment program lead right now. Uh, prior to the city of Austin, I worked for CDM and water for years on Texas, Texas, a master's in water resources engineering. Um, and I'm also the chair of the Municipal Water Infrastructure Council with EWRI. So it's interesting uh, that, that this entity, the NMSA, seems to have some uh, common goals so maybe we can coordinate a bit on those things um, but i'm going to talk today about stormwater control measure planning how we're selecting new stormwater control measure projects for a watershed retrofit program and then 
uh, once those assets are built, how we're doing asset management. So we have a watershed retrofit program with the city of Austin. Uh, and the intent of that program is to uh, remove pollution and improve stormwater management from untreated impervious cover. So those are typically areas of the city that were built before we had modern water quality regulations. Um, and, you know, we, we try to go back into those areas and, and do better in terms of stormwater management. And that's part of our MS4 uh, program. We're a phase one community, have been for a long time. Um, and we have a water quality monitoring program that informs priority of where we would select projects. And that's one factor of how we select projects, but there are other factors. And then we, uh, we do a cost benefit analysis that helps us to prioritize which to do first. And so we have a lot of different sources of potential projects, potential SCM projects. Uh, we have uh, some areas where we've completed preliminary engineering reports and studies that, that seek uh, new retrofit opportunities. Um, we have a screening tool that has identified all of our city-owned parcels and uh, also those that are owned by schools and uh, more where we have joint use agreements with some of those schools and uh, they've signaled their willingness to partner with us. So um, I think Scott mentioned sometimes it's beneficial to work on property you control. Um, so we've got a screening tool that's identified those types of parcels and also includes things like, do they have storm drain outfalls on them? And then we do a lot of uh, partnership type projects where we're either partnering with schools or on transportation projects. Um, things like that. And then uh, we also look at creating existing facilities. We already have a footprint on that Yeah, Lee, it seems like um, we're having... We've uh, been uh, inventorying potential Lee, projects from these if, various sources that come up in different ways. And hey, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to, to interrupt, Lee. Um, it's, you might want to pause your screen or, or something because it seems like it, we're, it's getting uh, get bogged down So because uh, there's a, a bit of a holdup. So I lost that last 30 seconds or so of what you've shared. Gotcha. You know, my uh, my kids are pretty much perpetually on Zoom these days uh, for virtual I, school, so that might be something I understand. That I, I understand in the same way. Gotcha. Go ahead, man. I'm sorry. Okay, so I don't know where I left off there, but I was uh, talking about different sources of potential stormwater control measure projects, from PERs, from studies, from uh, you know looking at city-owned parcels, partnership-type projects where you know we're getting cost-effective. Uh, opportunities with um, mo mobility or transportation type projects and other things like that, schools and such, parks. And then upgrading existing facilities. So taking a footprint that's already been dedicated to stormwater management and getting the most out of it. Uh, we have, so we've been inventorying these different potential projects. There's something like 545 potential right now. Uh, and we have 737 total projects. So that would include uh, projects we've built or rejected uh, or, or funded already. Um, of those, we've ha we have, kind of getting ahead of myself here a little bit, but we have drainage areas delineated for 132 of those potentials and, and preliminary footprints identified for 113 of those. Um, it's more work, you know, as you go in, you know, the better a project looks, the further you take it with your cost benefit analysis and you do a drainage area footprint, that sort of thing. And then we have 166 total projects in our uh, TIPS tool, which is a prioritization tool that I'm going to get into in a minute. And uh, we have 60 built projects that we've done through our watershed retrofit program. Uh, this is a, 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 
a snapshot of our GIS that shows all the different uh, potential projects, or some of them anyway, that we've identified. The yellow ones are potentials, the blue ones are funded. But this is just kind of a visual to go along with what I was saying with the inventorying of potential projects. And then how do we prioritize all these potentials as they come up? <clears throat> so I mentioned tips a second ago. That's the tool for inventory and prioritization of SEMs, which we thought sounded a little bit better than spit. Tips sounded, you know, a little bit more, uh, more reasonable there. Um, and then it, we have an, ex, it's, it's an Excel-based tool, uh, but we also have a geo database that goes with it um, that has uh, point locations for potential water quality projects. Also, uh, and you can see in this picture that the yellow again are the potentials. There's a green one over here that's a, uh, a built project. <clears throat> And then we have the the dark blue lines are drainage areas that we've delineated to potential project locations. And then the blue polygons are you know what I call like pinto beans, which are preliminary stormwater control measure footprints that we use to help with our analysis uh, for potential treatment potential. And then the um, the green translucent parcels. Um, are those that we've identified that are uh, public or city owned, either city of Austin right away or parks or some sort of city owned parcel that uh, that we've determined to have some kind of potential. <clears throat> uh, we have internal and external versions of the, our tips tool uh, so that we can distribute it to consultants who are evaluating potential projects on our behalf. Uh, and then, you know, once they've completed their work, we can fold it into our own tool. And then we have documentation for this tool. Uh, and this is all planning level. So the calculations and such performed for our analysis need to be fast. Uh, we're, we're usually analyzing th these things quickly. We can't model them all uh, to, you know, uh, continuous simulation swim model level. Uh, so we use a stochastic approach uh, that's developed by Adams and Papa. There's a book about it, but essentially estimates uh, capture volume or runoff capture efficiency, and then a, a quick pollution load uh, reduction calculations that are that are pretty quick and easy to implement, especially for simple systems. Uh, the primary uses of this tool. Uh, we inventory these potential projects, the ones that we've already found, so we have them stored, so we, we know where they are. Uh, we identify new projects uh, where we're looking to build something for, you know, where our environmental monitoring data says we should. Uh, and then we use this tool to evaluate <clears throat> uh, opportunities and, and uh, to prioritize them. And then we can uh, use this tool to rank different projects in different ways. So we can rank them globally, if you look at the first table, sorry for all the numbers there, I just took a snapshot out of the uh, tool, but you can look on the far right, uh, we have an overall score that's ranked uh, just from high to low. And so that kind of tells us, okay, we've looked at all these different things, which I'm not going to get into because we don't have time, but um, I'll, I'll, I'll touch the high level uh, things that we look at, which are load reduction, cost effectiveness, uh, erosion score. So uh, how, how well do these things protect against erosion in terms of improving hydrology? Uh, we have a, a water quality sensitivity score in terms of how sensitive is a particular area. Does it have uh, salamander habitat or karst features that go directly into an aquifer? Uh, we have feasibility. We have stakeholder support that we anticipate. Uh, how multifunctional is a facility? Like what else does it do besides remove pollution? And then we also look at equity. In Austin, we have a pretty nice dividing line along I-35 of, of uh, historically uh, minority and poor um, on the east side uh, and then the uh, opposite of that on the west side. So we're trying to, as a city to do better um, for our uh, economic segregation and, and uh, try to balance out our benefits across the city a bit better. Um, so uh, and then we uh, and you can see in the bottom table we're ranking prior EII reach. So what that EII stands for Ecological Integrity Index. That's our environmental monitoring data I mentioned earlier. But you can see we've got uh, 
projects rank within you know, particular reaches. We can rank in different ways too. Next to that is uh, to the left is a project category. So we might have a mobility corridor project. It might be uh, uh, a project on a school. You know, there's different types of projects that we can um, focus on, and and you know they may not be the top ranking overall, but it may be something that's good to do. Um, and so we might want to rank which ones are highest priority within a certain category, so that we can find the best, most impactful project to do on a school, for example. Oh, and then uh, we are also inventorying completed projects, and we use that to track our performance measures, like how many pounds of pollution have we uh, removed over time. And then we also have a cost database. Uh, so as we complete projects, we enter our bid tabs and develop uh, unit costs that we can use to predict costs for future projects. We have literature values in there as well. So the life of a potential SCM, uh, we begin you know, identifying we have studies, PRs that do that, partnership opportunities, a screening tool. Sometimes staff ID something, just to, they're out in the field looking at something and they see a good opportunity. Uh, so we can bring those into our geodatabase and, uh, for future evaluation. And then also sometimes the city acquires new land. We might evaluate those parcels for uh, retrofit opportunities. Um, visual GIS inspection is, is the next step once you have kind of a location picked out, we look in GIS with aerials and our storm drain infrastructure um, and topo and such, uh, see, does this seem like a great place to, um, to do a watershed retrofit? And again, I, I think I mentioned earlier, storm drain outfalls, things like that are indicators. Uh, you know, if, they, if storm drain empties into a city owned parcel uh, that's open green space and it has a lot of untreated impervious cover in the contributing drainage area, that seems like a pretty good spot to do a water quality control. Uh, so we will enter a point in the water quality projects layer uh, and then do a drainage area delineation. From there, we can calculate the impervious cover in that drainage area and do all of this in GIS. Uh, then we uh, draw a conceptual stormwater control measure footprint based on the uh, topography and the uh, site constraints uh, for a given parcel. Then we begin our data entry into TIPS where we enter all this information and complete our scoring. Uh, and then for the best projects, the ones that we select to do, we enter in our project delivery process. And then once a project is built, we do a final kind of project closeout in TIPS where we go back and make sure that we've documented our performance measures and uh, finalize our construction cost to update our cost database to help with uh, future uh, estimates. And so now I'm gonna shift gears a bit <clears throat> and talk a bit about, okay, well, what about when these things are built? Um, we began an asset management program, oh, I guess probably five years or so ago. And it's things that we were doing already, but we needed to formalize the process a bit and, and put numbers to it uh, to be more effective. So uh, the statement of need for asset management, we, we ascribe to is that um, this is needed to strategically plan resources for the ongoing repair, replacement, and rehabilitation of infrastructure. So you can see a picture there of where you know one of our pond, uh, part of part of our pond infrastructure has failed, and uh, these types of problems are important to fix. And uh, so, I, to give you guys an idea of the scale, we're talking about uh, the the uh, graph there on the left of our SCM inventory. SCM stands for stormwater control measure, which is pretty much synonymous with BMP, but uh, you know we, we changed terminology several years ago. Um, anyways, uh, public ponds make up about 13% of the inventory, so there are roughly a thousand of those. Uh, so the vast majority of uh, stormwater control measures in Austin are built by private de development in order to comply with uh, regulatory uh, requirements. And so, you know, roughly 7,000 of those. And the city of Austin has operation and maintenance responsibility for the public ponds, but not the private ones. We only inspect the private ones. And then on the right, you can see what proportion of those ponds are water quality versus flood. 
Uh, typically, SEM, as I mentioned earlier, is synonymous with BMP, but uh, we sometimes, uh, I guess we've started broadening that definition a bit to include flood ponds. So um, I, I specify now by saying water quality SCMs or flood SCMs. But you can see that, you know, most of the ponds we have are water quality ponds. There's fewer flood detention ponds. And so uh, we, you know, after inventorying our facilities, then we assign a condition based on inspection. And you can see with the diagram all the different pieces and parts that we inspect. The inlet structures, perimeter berms, the basin floor, outlet structure, spillway, that sort of thing. And uh, those are assigned a condition. So condition of one is excellent. Condition of five is extremely bad. Um, and so this helps us to, to identify, you know, what shape our asset is in. And then next we do uh, criticality. And I heard others uh, talk about this same thing. We do a criticality score for the flood function of a given SCM and also the water quality function. And we're essentially... Uh, quantifying you know, what we lose if a pond fails and doesn't exist anymore. And so that's kind of this consequence to failure. And um, so for flood, we look at whether this is a regulatory dam, that TCQ, our state environmental uh, uh, department monitors. We think about what downstream impacts we see. Uh, you know, are there buildings downstream of a facility that would be impacted if the pond failed? Same with streets. Are there streets that would be that would uh, experience flooding if a pond were to fail? Uh, we then we also look at what water quality benefits does the pond provide? Uh, and pollution load is is a good way to to kind of consolidate uh, the different factors that that affect pond performance. You know, the drainage area can be variable. The impervious cover of the drainage area can be variable, and then the pond volume can be variable. Uh, as well as the drawdown time, all of those things affect uh, the pollution load that a pond provides. We we're trying to make this super simple and just focus like, you know, use drainage area or pond volume or something like that. But it seemed like the pollutant load was the best way to uh, wrap all of that into one metric. Um, and then we also look, okay, well then how sensitive is this, uh, is the environmental area. Again, we have parts of town that uh, have recharge features that go directly into a, a aquifer that people drink water out of, and there's also endangered salamanders that live in it. So that area is a bit more sensitive uh, than some of the other parts of town that don't have that same direct connection to a drinking water supply. Um, and then we have, uh, you know, certain parts of town are more susceptible to erosion than others. The Blackland Prairies on our east side of town, you know, have highly erodible alluvial soils that that very small particle sizes that move very easily. Uh, the Edwards Aquifer, where we have the uh, limestone karst topography, uh, is less sensitive to erosion. So we uh, also look at what erosion benefit a pond provides. Uh, we have a study that shows if you have a certain volume drawn down over a certain time that it tends to uh, mitigate erosive flows to where they're not erosive. Um, they might be higher than pre-developed, but they're still non-erosive. So uh, that's how we quantify uh, the erosion benefit a pond provides. So all of that folds into this criticality rating, and we have a rating of one through five. Uh, one is insignificant. If you have a tiny pond um, that's not doing a whole lot, then it's less critical than a large pond that if it fails would wash out a road and um, you know dump pollution into a recharge feature so that's where we assign criticality and then we do again that for both flood and water quality and we take the maximum of the two to be the criticality score and then uh, from the criticality and condition um, assignments we determine our priority ratings and you know you can kind of see how something with a high a high or a poor condition I should say and a high criticality would have a very high priority um, and you know low criticality and a good condition would get a low priority and this shows uh, once we applied the scheme to our full inventory and you know, what we ended up with um, so you know one percent of the ponds uh, were, were in that high priority 
a very high priority. 3% were, were high, 22% were medium. So we focus on those first. It gives us a way to prioritize our efforts and our money uh, to address the, the worst problems first. And then this is another just great outcome of asset management is so then we can predict over the course of time based on our growth, based on other trends. You know, one trend in Austin right now is we're getting a lot more smaller SCMs and there's more of them. Um, so then, you know, that could potentially affect our maintenance per pond. Um, but, you know, we can estimate what type of renewal needs we'll have, distribute that over a particular time frame, and then uh, see how our budget might grow uh, that, that we would need uh, for maintaining our public pond inventory. So with that, I'll, I'll pause and stop and, and see if there are questions. And uh, hopefully my internet didn't cut out again and you guys were able to hear the rest of my talk. No, we heard all of it. No, that's great. Um, yeah, a couple of quick questions um, that have come in. Uh, one question that came in is said, what is the criteria matrix used for in terms of prioritizing? Is, is it used for prioritizing projects? I, I assume that's the, so the question is, what is the criteria matrix used for? Uh, I think they're, are, are, do they mean this one or? I, I'm assuming that's the one. Or but. this one actually when as, as far as the timing of the when this question came in i'm think it's i think it's this one okay yeah we use this to, to select uh watershed retrofit projects and when i say watershed retrofit that means going into a watershed that has untreated impervious cover and then treating that impervious cover uh as opposed to going into ponds that are uh broken and fixing them or enhancing them Although, you know, that could also be a watershed retrofit, I suppose. Um, but we use these to select new uh, projects to go into uh, watersheds or reaches that have poor environmental monitoring scores and uh, implement uh, and prioritize and implement new water quality SCMs. Does that make mm -hmm. sense? Okay, so that ranking is different than the criticality ranking, though, correct? Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. So this is the difference is this is for new projects, new ponds, um, and then the other one, this is for existing ponds that are broken or, or otherwise have problems that need to be fixed. Okay, so that's similar to kind of the layout that I had, which is look at the status of ponds, and then once you look at that, then you can look at it in the context of condition and criticality. So that's that's interesting. Um, Okay, I think that addresses that. The next question that came in said, why isn't quality, I'm sorry, why isn't quantity considered a water quality criticality metric? I guess the question is is trying, um, if you've got water quantity issues, aren't you going to have, um, I guess, more erosion, right? But you have erosion that's that's tied into your, your criticality, right? That's Correct. Uh, we have, when we do our criticality uh, um, assignment, we do a criticality score for flood, so water quantity, which is, I think, what the, the person was asking about. Yeah. Uh, and then we look at water quality, and within the water quality criticality score are two pieces. There's the pollution load and the environmental sensitivity, and then erosion potential, like the erosion benefit that the pond provides, and how sensitive an area is to uh, those erosive flows. Okay, because I do. Th I think the question is trying to get at why isn't quantity considered a water quality issue? And I, and I think it's yeah. there's 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 two things. There's the there's the quantity such as flooding, which is what you have there on the on the flood criticality. Sure. But and, and where, guess, where quantity would come into the quality side would be this erosion, I would assume, right? I that's would think yeah, for sure. That that is part of it, and then also. Um, I mean, depending on how you're defining water quantity, um, you know, the more volume you have moving through a facility, the greater pollutant load reduction you would typically have. So right. uh, to some extent, there's a runoff volume component in the pollutant load uh, reduction. Yep. Okay. And, and another uh, question that came in that's kind of associated with all of this, I think, is is there, you know, because you're looking at watersheds, right? So, um, which I think is a is a great way to look at this, by the way. Um, 
do you somehow tie in um, stream health or stream impacts? As you know, you got the erosion sensitivity there, but I, I'm sure. thinking about maybe bio, you know, biological uh, or habitat. Um, does, does that come into into you know? Because you could have erosive flows that are still impactful for biota. So it sounds like the question is about um, tying in stream assessments into this as well, or does that come into the into play? Uh, that's a good question. So again, this matrix for criticality is applied to existing facilities, and it has to be fast and reproducible because we do it every year. And so this is about as complicated as we could get with this criticality scoring for a particular asset um, and keep it you know, reproducible on an annual basis. Uh, gotcha. Let me back up though real quick because we do have some other things that we consider mostly for new projects. Um, so these polygons that you see in the picture um, are, are colored based on their ecological integrity index score, which we derive from uh, monitoring at, at the outlet of each of these highlighted uh, drainage areas is a monitoring station. Uh, in this case, it's in Tannehill Creek. And so at each of those monitoring stations, we monitor lots of things. <laughs> so there's water chemistry, aquatic uh, life, uh, you know, um, nutrient scores, presence of water. You know, we're in a fairly semi-arid climate where sometimes these creeks just straight go dry. Right. Uh, and so we do consider environmental or stream health in that way. And then I'll take it a step further in that um, we're doing what's called, we're calling objective zero, where we're actually doing full-blown watershed modeling and receiving water modeling uh, to try and predict uh, what goals might be achievable uh, to improve stream health over time. Um, and so that's kind of a step beyond just monitoring, but we're going into uh, set goals that we can then plan SCMs and other things to try and achieve uh, in, a, in a given time frame. Okay. So it is, it is, you have a way to kind of bring that in on your assessments. Okay. But not in the same, because you have to do this repeatable thing every year. That's, and it might be harder to do that to get that same granular information on the stream side. Yeah. Like. Yeah. And I, I guess I want to distinguish a bit between uh, what we're doing for asset management, which is for existing ponds, right? Yep. Versus new facilities and new uh, management approaches to watershed. Uh, that that are a bit more comprehensive in our approach. Right. Okay, that's a good point. That's a good point about asset management for existing versus planned assets, right? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's great. So I got another question that came in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you while I launch the last poll. So folks watching, please, uh, this is the last poll, and these are helpful for us um, to know about. Again, this is similar to what um, what we asked before is uh, the information that Lee provided here. Is this something that um, that you're familiar with, or your organization, or your community is familiar with? Is this something that uh, is 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 this new information, or is it relatively new or familiar? Are you doing this already, or are you doing something differently, something like that? So, take some time to do that. In the meantime, I was going to ask Lee. Um, there was a question about when retrofitting with flood criticality in mind. Uh, what is the flooding event that you you have to use to retrofit to? So what are the goals as far as, and I assume that has to do if it's a if it's TEC or TCEQ, then it's something that's mandated by the state. But you know, it probably it probably depends is the answer. But I wanted to I wanted to throw that out to you. Yeah, um, and I'm more of a water quality guy than a flood guy, but I, I speak some flood. Um, so I'd say, first of all, that's a fairly complicated question. Uh, we have in Austin, um, you know, essentially you have to, depending on the, the project and what's going on, you, we, we definitely look at the Q100 in terms of uh, no increase in the water surface elevation of the 100-year the uh, peak flow um, for new development. So you're not allowed to, have, you know, create an adverse impact for your your downstream neighbor, uh, and then that's complicated though in that we just completed our Atlas 14 study 
that essentially made the old 500 year storm the new 100 year storm and the old 100 year storm is now the new 25 year storm so you know there's probably a lot of ponds out there detention ponds that were constructed to match peak flows for the 100 year and uh you also have, i think have to meet the 25 and the 10 maybe the two sometimes it, it depends on the situation um, okay. but there's going to be a lot of ponds out there that are now you know not compliant with those regs and uh right. you know i'm guessing that if you were then to go retrofit uh those ponds you would be probably retrofitting for the new 100 year which was the old 500 year so if that's making your head spinning i, I don't blame <laughs> Well, thanks for that, Lee. No, I appreciate that you brought that up. You mentioned um, about NAMSA and, and the role that you're involved with with um, uh, EWRI, and love to follow up on that. Sure. Um, but on that same point, um, one thing that NAMSA has been um, involved with is advocating for um, uh, upgrade of Atlas 14 to be for the entire country, and mm -hmm. Texas is basically our the one that we point to. That's our the pilot case that we point to and say look it's it's significant so i appreciate that you brought that up that's an important thing we should we could have a whole other separate uh, webcast on that so right uh, and i and i so that's I, I know that's not as easy to answer some of these questions so i'm going to close this poll most of you have voted i appreciate that and it looks like um so some for you know a small percentage of you it's um you're either implementing this type of program or a different program or it's completely new so that's kind of a, maybe it's like a little bit of a normal distribution that way whereas looks like most of you it's either relatively new or familiar um, but you haven't implemented anything as of yet and those are that's all good information and uh, i appreciate that yeah and, and i would say too for for anybody who'd be interested in uh you know, talking with me, or I'd be happy to share some of the approaches that we use and tools that we use, because um, uh, I would hate for someone to have to kind of reinvent the wheel. Uh, you can spin your wheels and do a lot of work on trying to estimate pollution loads, uh, and we, we have things available that make it a bit easier uh, than trying to do a CS swim model or something like that. Agreed. Um, that's a great point, and that's what we're really trying to do here. Um, uh, Lee, I appreciate that a lot uh, in terms of trying to help spread information so that people don't have to go from zero, right? We can exactly. we can we can learn from each other, and I appreciate that a lot. Sure. Um, okay, so I'm going to move on to uh, our next. We do have some other questions, but I think some of these could come up um, as we go along. But I also want to have some time for our our panel discussion, our our, our um, panel plus discussion, I'll call it, a facilitated discussion. So Lee, I'm going to take the uh, I'm going to take the screen back, if that's okay with you. Okay, thank you. Thanks. And again, I appreciate uh, both presentations from Scott and from Lee. It's great information, great information, absolutely. Uh, so we want to have a facilitated discussion here. And again, I, you know, I'm hoping also that questions can come in from uh, the audience on, on what we're going to be talking about. I've got some questions here to start to seed the discussion. And, and, and so we're going to have Scott and Lee who You've all you've just you've just heard from, and I'll be involved to facilitate. But we also have a couple other folks that are joining in, and uh, it's Dave Smith and Trey Shank. So, Dave, do you want to um, maybe give a little bit of background, bio on, on where you're coming from, and what your thoughts are about all that we've talked about or what you've seen so far? Sure. Thanks, Seth. And great presentations, by the way. I really learned a lot. I knew I was going to get more out of this than I was going to put in. Um, yeah, I'm Dave Smith, and I work for the Environmental Protection Agency in our Pacific Southwest region, and I'm an assistant director there in the water division. Um, current portfolio includes a lot of uh, uh, work related to uh, water infrastructure spending and planning, um, but for a long time, I was our uh, NPDES uh, permitting uh, manager in our region. So, but uh, stormwater management and stormwater permitting holds a special place in my heart. So. Uh, uh, spending a lot of time in my current and previous jobs working with communities to try to help build capacity to do better, which is, I think, what this kind of webinar is trying to do. And, you know, we're really uh, happy to you know, see it happening and, and hear about these really great examples of local practitioners finding ways to do it better. Um, I'll just say one or two things. Um, I, I talk to a lot of community uh, stormwater management agencies and communities, and and find that those who have found ways to invest in these kinds of asset management 
and planning tools are really happy they did it after they do it. But it's often hard to kind of build the business case to do it up front. It, you know, I understand, and particularly in smaller communities, how busy the stormwater managers are and how, you know, the idea of finding additional time to create and put into place these kinds of tools uh, seems really daunting. And uh, so I, I encourage you to, you know, keep looking for ways to make that business case in your community and to encourage your managers to support maybe making that investment. Uh, I'm very confident that it tends to pay off and reduce your, your long-term uh, program costs uh, if you do so. A couple areas that I'll highlight that I've noticed a big difference is um, where, where we are able to invest in these kinds of tools, we think it helps your funding case, um, both because it provides a much clearer sense of what do I need to do where, and it's, it shows that you have a much more uh, sort of complete plan, not only about what new stuff needs to be done, but what needs to be done in the area of operations and maintenance to really take care of the facilities uh, that are already in place. And, um, you know, we, we, I work a lot with funders, both at EPA and at other agencies that provide funding for stormwater related work. And this is one thing we're increasingly looking for is, uh, do you have the capability to take care of what you built? And those who have an asset management system in place and are actively using it, you know, they can really make that case that they know how to take care of the assets that we build. Um, and that you show, we kind of have an understanding of our whole system and how it operates and therefore how any new project might fit into that overall system. Um, as an old permitting guy, I also have to say that, you know, we're increasingly seeing in a lot of parts of the country, water quality based drivers um, expressed through stormwater permits to uh, reduce pollution loads. And uh, I'm a big believer in the idea that it, it's good for communities to be given credit for planning well, what kinds of practices need to be put in place to address water quality problems. And uh, we believe that you know, investing in asset management, and in some cases, some of the analytics underlying it, like Lee was talking about in particular, uh, can really help make the permitting case that you know, we have a plan going forward for addressing our stormwater problems that we believe will be effective in addressing sediment or bacteria or uh, you know, other specific nutrients, other pollutants of concern that you're supposed to address. And uh, I, I think there's a lot of potential to uh, use these kinds of tools and to increasingly bring them more explicitly into permitting as a way for you to demonstrate that you know what to do going forward and to, you know in, in another way to put it sort of leave us alone and let us do the plan rather than expecting us to you know demonstrate incremental water quality results every year which is really hard to do with stormwater um, and i'll just stop there because I, I know we want to hear from trey but i'm looking forward to the dialogue to come Excellent. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for that opening, and I appreciate that. Trey, do you have? Uh, can you provide your back a little info in your background and some thoughts on what you've heard so far? Yeah, excellent. Uh, thanks, Seth. Uh, Trey Shanks. I'm with Freeze and Nichols. We're a, a consulting engineering firm um, that primarily works with municipalities. And my background specifically is, um, you know, MS4 water quality, stormwater quality compliance, um, funding mechanisms. Uh, stormwater management overall and, um, you know, and asset management. So kind of the progression of things for, for my career is, is a little bit what's happening, you know, here with this, that really as MS4 has come into be a mature expectation requirement for storm systems, um, a recognition that, hey, asset management is really a tie-in um, a logical management approach to effectively um, execute um, MS4 um, programs. Uh, both Scott and Lee's presentations I thought were fantastic and spot on and really touched on some great fundamentals um, and, and some more, you know, I guess, mature concepts uh, of things that they are doing. So I was uh, really glad to see those um, for everybody's uh, edification. So um, and, uh, just a couple of quick comments, I guess I'll note is, um, you know, you know, Lee made a, a note about something um, when he asked about the flood that's really a common issue that a lot of times with stormwater ponds in particular, storm systems, 
there's a division of responsibilities in the structure of a utilities department. The water quality is handled out of one department and flood protection is handled out of another. Um, that's a common issue that communication um, and at some point maybe even structural you know, considerations about the organization of a, of a department um, as a consideration. But recognizing that, I think I was really glad that Lee brought that um, up. And then similarly, Scott in his presentation noted about um, when you're thinking of the level of service, you know, we're kind of on a mindset of thinking maybe of flood protection, water quality protection, maybe environmental protection. Then you've got these adjacent property owners that say, hey, that's my aesthetic benefit. That's why I bought this house over here because there's a beautiful pond in the backyard. You know, um, you know, and I can't touch on the whole use of county land aspect of things, but um, but that's a reality is recognizing that there are other stakeholders who um, may have a desire for input and at least need communication and potentially need to be factored into the decision-making um, process. Um, Dave already mentioned the, the funding benefit of all this. Um, asset management, frankly, probably wouldn't really exist if funding was unlimited. Um, we just go spend it all. But it, all this is about of where do I put my limited resources? So um, I think he's already touched on that uh, well. Whether it's you know for justifying to decision makers, but also you know if you're getting loans or grants, there's potential for loan forgiveness, you know, um, you know, or rate reductions. Um, you know, for some entities, uh, it's a mandate um, to be, to qualify for a grant that you have to show that you've got a basic asset management program in place. So that's something to have you know, consideration uh, for. There was one other comment um, asked, uh, I guess, a question, Seth, about the prioritization. Um, and I thought it was a really good question because th there's almost two spots, I think, of when you're thinking of ranking um, you know, your assets or doing you know, an asset evaluation. One is that condition criticality assessment, um, which is your kind of color-coded matrix of where are highest you know, risks. Um, but then from that, um, depending on what the um, asset is, depends on what action do we take. It may be that the action is we need to, to reconstruct it. It may be that the proper action is it's highly critical, but it's in good condition. We we just need to make absolutely sure we're doing frequent inspections so it never fails. Um, so think so the cost benefit of what action you select, you know, um, and then what approach you take. Um, I, I think of those as two different types of prioritizations to to work through. But it may be, for example, and which we'll find is that a vast, not maybe majority, but a significant percentage of your assets and this may not be specific to Swarner Ponds, but just in general, it may be that what you decide is we're okay with being reactive with a run, what we call a run to failure um, approach that when it fails, the consequence is low enough that it's okay. We'll wait till it fails. We're not going to spend money on inspecting right. that um, and we'll let it go from there. So yeah, anyways. That, makes, that makes a lot of sense. And that's, that's the point here is that we want to look this in, in a nuanced view, right? Because right. we only have, you know, a certain amount of, um, you know, we've got funding limitations, right? And so what, how, how do we get that purse is only this so big, right? Yeah. So how are we going to do that? So I, I've developed some of these questions and I think some of you, I think, I think Dave and Trey, I think you both kind of hit on some of the advantages already on asset management. And, you know, as, as we're going through this discussion, I still, I, you know, I, I still have the question box open here. So if folks have questions that they want to ask is that, that we're talking about, we don't have to be limited to these, these questions. This is just kind of a starting point. So keep that in mind if there's something that you're hearing that you want to uh, provide some other input on. But it sounded like, you know, Trey and Dave, you guys gave some thoughts about the advantage of asset management planning, but better, you know, more efficient investments and and better planning can can help you out to get more money, right? In, in terms of, of showing that you know what you can, you know, what, what your plan is. It's a lot easier to get money. Someone's going to trust that you're going to actually invest it wisely and, and, um, and take care of the asset. I wanted to ask uh, Scott and Lee if you guys had any thoughts about this, this adva the advantage of asset management planning or just planning in general for stormwater. I know that when uh, you know I was involved with EPA, some listening sessions in Georgia actually, and they talked about in, in the Atlanta area, they talked about, man, if we had more money for planning, we could do a lot more, but we just don't have that money. It's hard to get that money. But any, anyway, um, Lee or, or Scott, do you guys have any thoughts about the advantages of uh, planning, planning, especially for asset management planning. From uh, this is Scott. 
we we do a pretty decent job on our BMP side of things because of our annual inspections and maintenance. Um, we typically don't have the money in the pot, so to speak, when we have major things pop up, like we get a hurricane come through and we had one of our BMP uh, dams blow out. And um, so, but usually we end up building enough up in that reserve after about two years or so to cover those major costs. Um, on the drainage infrastructure side, it's a lot more challenging on asset management because, you know, we have hundreds of miles and structures in the ground and you know asset management on that level you just have to have you know the resources required to do that i hate to say are insurmountable but it's just not the same as like the utility sector with the collection system to build up you know the resources needed to maintain the storm sewer infrastructure if anybody's doing that around the country i'd love to know how <laughs> I'd love to. So, Scott, let me clarify then what, because you shared information and it was, as a lot of it was about um, pond uh, corrections and retrofits in order basically for a regular, to meet a regulatory um, goal, right? That's, it, and that's, that might be a little bit different type of approach than here's an asset management that, you know, approach that also includes regulatory. So, did you, when, when you did your planning, Scott, was it truly kind of an asset management type we, of thing or was it more about? we don't call it an asset management program. We just call it our, you know, our maintenance program or what, inspection and maintenance kind of thing. We, we have a, uh, you know, an in-house design software system that keeps up with all of our BMPs. So we know, we know 98% of our BMPs, their location, what their type is. We do, you know, annual inspection, maintenance, some of our BMPs, you know, such as Phil Terra's require, you know, six months, you know, maintenance. Um, so we're already doing that on the BMP side. And, you know, it goes a long way to preventing those, you know, major, you know, failures because you know, we're keeping up with it every year. Okay. What about ponds? Because you mentioned Filtera, but what about ponds specifically? Is that that's part of that same inspection and maintenance? Yep. Yep. And every, every type of BMP has its own inspection criteria. So ponds, you know, we do the inspections once a year. Um, we do, you know, maintenance around the dam, uh, make sure it's cut, um, clean out, you know, the trash racks, things like that. All that gets done on an annual basis for our ponds. Okay. But you you don't do the con the criticality and um, condition kind of analysis, not not something like that necessarily. No, because we've been doing this for so many years, um, it's not like we need to start up to do that evaluation. So to you know, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Okay. Excellent. Well, so Lee, yeah, Lee, any thoughts to share? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think planning to some extent. Um, I'm a believer because I think it's best everybody would like to do lots of planning, right? So that they could focus on the highest impact problems and, uh, you know, uh, perhaps be able to predict when you might need more funding or, or you know, it's, it's hard once you realize you have a really large problem to go uh, do a bond and then have the problem fixed in time. So I think the cool thing about this asset management planning is you can predict, oh gosh, you know, we have all these facilities that are going to all be 100 years old at the same time and probably start crumbling. We need to plan ahead now because, uh, you know, like I, in Austin, there were these rashes of development. You know, in the 80s, a lot of storm drain was built. Uh, you know, here we're coming up on 2020, those things are all getting to be 40 years old. Um, and so, you know, where, where you have these different waves of development, you can kind of start to predict when it's going to start to crumble. And so, you know, if you can then uh, have a condition on all these, these assets and then start to predict when you might need an infusion of cash to correct problems or build new infrastructure, then you can, you know, uh, make a case for a bond election, something like that, so that you're not scrambling then at the last minute trying to fix a bunch of problems in an inefficient manner. So I think to me that's, that's the you know holy grail you're trying to do stuff like that and then in terms of water quality you know uh 
in absence of a TMDL type approach where you know where to put stuff and to get a certain target load, we're always just trying to pick the highest impact of the best cost benefit uh, project to get the, the most bang for the buck. Uh, and so that type of planning is, is, is satisfying as well to know that whatever you're doing is, is well spent. Uh, otherwise, it's kind of a scattershot thing and you may or may not be having a significant impact. But to some extent, that type of planning can be a luxury. You know, it requires staff, it requires money. Um, and, you know, uh, I can understand why there's varying levels of planning. And so I think probably it's for most municipalities with limited resources, it's that sweet spot of, you know, planning, but not planning too much. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, Seth, point. I was wondering if I could chime in on this. Absolutely, one. absolutely. Um, this 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 issue about how can a program find the, the resources to do this kind of planning is a really widespread issue and concern. Yeah. Uh, everybody's already busy enough without looking for more stuff to do, and, and I totally get that. You know, we we uh, working with our environmental finance center out here in our region uh, have worked with some smaller communities to kind of explore. You know, what does it take to get them going in this asset management arena and to you know, expand the range of assets that they can actively track? And, you know, I, I will share that um, one thing that a lot of communities have found works really well, or some communities have found works well, is interns. Um, if you've got a, a college or a, you know, uh, I don't know, even conceivably, um, you, know, other, you know, high school, it is conceivable to bring in volunteers or intern type people to help out to do some of the legwork and the field work. And, and we found that it's possible to do a pretty good job popping those manholes and going out and looking at facilities and, and coming up with at least a, a, fir, a, a first approximation of asset inventory that's a little broader than you know, what you can get if you can spare very little time to do it. And our, our, our colleagues in, in uh, the small community of Paso Robles, California, for example, were able to inventory everything with a lot of help from, from a couple of interns. So that, that, that's one that they really like. But I'll also add, you know, there are some funding sources that, that do make money available for stormwater planning. And it varies a little bit by state, but for example, some states through their state revolving fund programs provide either forgivable loans or grants as part of their green project reserves or otherwise, particularly for smaller and more disadvantaged communities for planning. And I've seen people make the case to, to do some, basically say, well, in order to develop this project proposal, we have to do some of the asset management planning around it. And so, you know, I, th I think it's worth kind of looking for some of that. I've also seen a few communities look to you, you know, try to make the connection between what we're talking about and what they're doing through sort of post-construction related requirements that are in their permits. And essentially put some of the burden on uh, private landowners who are doing new development to help pay for some, some of this uh, planning and uh, development of asset management capacity um, as part of the, the impact fees they pay around developments. But I mean, I do think this is an area we need to explore more. How do we help people get to the starting line to be able to do this yeah. um, and, and be able to get it done? Well, Dave, like I said, I was, doing, I, I was involved in these listening sessions across the country related to the Environmental Finance Advisory Board, Stormwater Funding Task Force, as you know about. And that was one of the most consistent, you know, from Seattle to Atlanta to Chicago and everywhere else. It was that there's a there's a need for this planning because everyone's so busy tied up you know not just not just with funding but just resources they don't have the time so your idea about using a small army of interns is makes a lot of sense i remember hearing a talk from andy reese from uh, who's with wood uh, he always talked about you know we've got cell phones and you can do a lot more with that cell phone than you could in the past so um there is there's there's a way to to activate uh, you know, interns that way i think uh, i'll add one more and this is where i put my black hat on um, increasingly, we're seeing permits require use of asset management for stormwater systems. We've done it in a couple of permits we've issued in my in, in my region, and uh, at least a, a couple that the state of California has issued. And privately, some of the local program managers are saying, "We'll do it if you require it, but if it's optional, we can't." And yeah. I'm not saying I'm pushing that everywhere. That's <laughs> not the right tool for everywhere. Well, <laughs> but um, just just a consideration that you know 
sometimes people like to be told what to do and we find a way to do things we have to do sometimes. It's like taking a cold medicine when you you have to take it. Well, if I have to, then I, I'm just saying it's the regulator. When the regulator on the <laughs> says that you just you say require. No, I understand. No, I understand. That's a good point. I wanted to ask. I just I know this we can't get through all this stuff. Obviously, we only have about ten minutes left. And I wanted to kind of uh, to to group two or three of these questions. Actually, uh, questions two, three, and four together. And first, I want to ask you guys, Trey. I'll start with you since you've like see a cross section of of different communities. Do you see a lot? of asset management going on in the sector, whether it's for ponds or otherwise? If not, why not? And then what can we do to change that? So those kind of questions two, three, and four there. Any thoughts on on all of that? Yeah. Um, so what I'd say for stormwater infrastructure, the use of asset management planning relative to other water, other infrastructure, water, you know, other public infrastructure, um, I would say it's relatively low implementation right now. Um, you know, uh, water, wastewater, roadway, um, electric industry all have a, a much higher um, adopt, uh, adoption rate uh, for asset management planning so far. Um, part of that has been that, uh, in general, you, you'll see municipal infrastructure, stormwater infrastructure, isn't seen as its own utility. You know, and right. that's changed over the last you know 10 or 15 years. So there's more, I'd say, of a kind of a middle level understanding of asset management that it does apply to stormwater systems. What we have seen is there's a very high interest in um, you know, implementing um, asset management concepts for stormwater management programs. I don't know that I'd say we've seen too many um, entities that, are, that flat out say we've got an asset, a mature asset management program for stormwater um, infrastructure. But I would say that there's definitely more of a um, uh, a use of the concepts of getting some risk-based you know assessments and prioritizations, doing the condition assessments. A lot of what's logical is just formalizing a little bit. Um, and to echo um, something that Dave said on this, something that's a really key message um, for this and gets maybe to your question three of why don't we see more of this in the stormwater sector? Um, early in the understanding of asset management. I think sometimes there's an expectation that, well, I can't get going until I get a full inventory of my system and I get all the condition assessment, you know, and this heavy lift kind of stepwise. And really what's better is you know, do shallow runs across, work with the data you've got, make the best decision you can with the information you have and go show some early wins because really you're just focusing on those top few assets to begin with that are the most critical. And that's something that shows the payoff and that helps justify more investment as you go. That's, I mean, it's a good point, and that's one of the reasons, and I think it's strategically, that makes a lot, or tactically, whatever, depending on how you look at it, makes a lot of sense to do that. Instead of having to do everything, do bite-sized chunks, right? Kind of, you got to crawl before you can run or whatever the term is. Um, so that's why we were thinking ponds might be one of those things, that instead of doing everything, at least you start someplace that seems to be, does that make sense, or are you thinking about some other kind of asset on the stormwater side? So a lot of what we see a, an emphasis on is the uh, storm pipe system, um, and and it's I would say probably one of the areas you can find the most uh, financial gain um, by uh, you know as and Lee was talking about identifying where do we need to go for bond program you know projects you know if you've got 30, 30 year old corrugated metal pipe under you know your roads. You're probably getting a little nervous about it corroding and you know collapsing. Um, that's something we're seeing a lot of. Um, the the bane of any municipality's existence of we just reconstructed this road. Now next year yeah, we're right. tearing it up to go replace the storm pipe. Right. I was just going to say coordinated and kind of opportunistic things, right? Yeah. That's right. And so those are those quick financial wins to be able to show say, hey, we've identified where our priority pipes are that need to be replaced. We've coordinated it with the road rehabilitation, road reconstruction. Um, and by doing those in concert, we've saved four hundred thousand dollars. You know, so there, those are the big dollars. You know, to save early without a lot of heavy investment up front. And that, I guess that shows to your city council or whoever, hey, this works and this has benefits and this is saved us some good money. Good business practice. That's right. And lever leverage that and kind of pivot from there. That's a good point. Right. Dave, yeah, I'll also there? I'll also note Seth that a number of communities are finding that avoided liability is a really persuasive argument to make to like to council members and people like that. I mean, if you do that maintenance or that replacement and you avoid having a, a BMP blowout and cause maybe flooding damage, or you, know, you take care of an asset so you don't have 
trip and falls or you know other kinds of you know accidents that happen and then people make claims against the city um just one of those liability claims can blow out the whole budget for a stormwater program for a year and yeah. depending on the situation and i i think that uh even elected officials can uh can understand the appeal of avoided yeah. liability um so and 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 if you show how an asset program can help you uh, reduce your liability in some of these areas around the assets. Um, there may be a little more willing to invest in it. Good points. Good points. Um, Lee, I wanted to ask you. You and on, on the um, on your presentation, you showed that the vast majority of uh, the ponds in your in in your city are privately owned and operated. So I wanted to go to this this question number five here is. Um, do these dynamics related to to you know private ownership and private you know because it sounds like I, I think you said that you guys have to inspect but you don't have to do anything beyond inspection on private facilities so any thoughts about like asset management or trying to to, to make some changes here especially for ponds um but anything else beyond that if we want to talk about that on the privately owned versus publicly owned side is there any thoughts on that sure yeah i, I think um the, the ponds that are on private property are are, um, are are there are private responsibility for maintenance, and there has for sure been, um, I guess a a problem with some of those ponds not being maintained, and then you know the city has limited tools in order to uh, you know make them maintain. But really, I think what we one of the things that we found is that education is as effective as anything else in helping these uh, private property owners maintain their facilities. Uh, a good number of them don't know what they are, don't know what they're for, don't really understand how to fix them uh, or how to go about fixing them. So I think, you know, in terms of uh, municipal uh, operations, one of our functions is to educate uh, these private property owners uh, on what to do and how and why and all of that um, and, and provide technical assistance where we can uh, but then we do also have some tools uh, for you know issuing notices of violation and such like that but uh, in texas you have to be kind of careful about that as well um, you know because you always have the specter of the state legislature cracking down on the on the blueberry and the tomato soup uh, that is Austin, Texas. <laughs> but uh, so, so uh, you know, but but I think to your point though, we we could not, I don't think, effectively maintain all of those uh, with our change utility fee money. So we we prefer to keep that model of, of private property maintenance of their infrastructure. And then yeah, how do they plan for when their facility is going to fail? You know, uh, yeah there's probably not that same level of asset management going on. we're not currently doing that yeah yeah that's an issue and I'm, I'm in fairfax virginia so i'm you know i'm not in chesterfield but in a community that's similar scott as you know uh, for fairfax and i think i think majority of the uh, facilities here are privately owned and, and and i know there's some um there's some concern about taking on that liability um what do you have, have what have you, we only have a couple like a minute or two left here so scott do you have any quick thoughts about private facilities in your community? Um, I think, you know, it, it would be a, a huge undertaking to take over those also. We've had tremendous residential growth, so the number of BMPs that we are maintaining is, you know, outpacing our ability. We just added an, another crew this past, uh, about two years ago, I guess, but I mean, you know, in the, the way the political winds blow, uh, we've had, you know, conversations within the past couple of years as to why, you know, should we keep doing this? And it's kind of like, well, we've started, it, it's well maintained now. If we switch back to the way it was, everything's going to fall apart again. And then we're going to be looking at, you know, major, major failures that the people are looking at the county to come back in and fix. I know some of uh, the other localities I deal with have gone to, you know, putting not only the 
stormwater ponds or BMPs under the HOAs, but also the, the storm sewer infrastructure. All right. So can you imagine a HOA that's not only responsible for their BMP, but all the storm sewers underneath their roads and so forth? I mean, that doesn't that seem very just, feasible. You know, <laughs> so, as, as Lee was saying, you know, you go 30, 40 years out, what are those localities going to be dealing with in those right. failures? Yeah, it's all the more reason it seems like to think about that. And and I know that, that there's no easy answers with, uh, especially with the private property issue. And that's come up with all of these webcasts that we've had. Um, obviously, we can't, we're running, we've run out of time here, so we don't, we can't get to all these questions. Um, I did want to highlight for folks as we wrap up, you know, if you want to get any this record recording of this as well as the others, go to that, uh, that URL that's listed on the screen now. If you have any questions, let me know. Uh, Dave and Trey, um, since you guys joined us at the end here, do you want to have any to share any last thoughts? One thing that I'm kind of curious as, as we wrap up here is um, what what can NAMSA do to try to help um, address some of these challenges? We're trying to do what we can through webinars and whatnot, but Anything that we can do specifically, maybe in the near term or or even in the long term on this front, that'd be helpful to know. Yeah, I guess just real quickly, I'll let Dave go. Is one is keep beating the drum. I think you know doing what you're doing and and you know being that advocate uh, for this and keeping that message out there is probably the most important thing. The communication of things. Um, I would say, um, you know, what you're already doing even through this is, you know, be a resource for technical guidance about approaches to get started. I thought it was great that Lee offered, you know, to share what he's created and, and all that helps to agree the skids, get everybody going, you know, lower that barrier to entry or that perceived barrier to entry into getting started in the process. Um, and going back to needing, you know, it really still gets to needing to be able to convince leadership, your decision makers, your, your purse string holders. Um, so whatever that can be provided from an industry-wide standpoint to say, here's, here's some you know, information about the cost effectiveness of this approach. Here's why this makes fiscal sense um, to take this approach. I think those would be the keys. Maybe focus on the bottom line, the economic value when mm -hmm. it comes to that. That's what uh, political leaders definitely <laughs> and decision makers. They understand to. money. That's right. They do understand money. Exactly. Dave, any, any final thoughts? Well, just two quick things, building up on what Trey said. Multi-benefits sell. Um, increasingly, people are seeing the different kinds of stormwater management practices like ponds yield multiple benefits in many places. Habitat, flood control, water quality, maybe capture for use to augment supply, things like that. And um, building the tools to be able to tell the story about the different kinds of benefits they provide is, uh, seems to be critical in unlocking the door to different kinds of funding and patching that funding together to build the kind of capability we need to manage those kinds of assets that are maybe designed to achieve multiple uh, benefits. So it, it's both an opportunity and it's an obligation. Uh, the other thing I'll say for NAMS's uh, point, uh, I'll put in a plug for the, uh, the, the recently posted uh, Excellence in Stormwater Management uh, toolbox that uh, was added to the NAMSA website. Uh, EPA partnered with NAMSA and some other folks to develop some resources and tools addressing a bunch of areas in stormwater program development, including asset management. And I encourage people to take a look at that. Um, it's got, I think, some pretty useful resources that can help you begin to get started in, in taking on um, asset management and BMP um, you know, BMP uh, operations and maintenance. And uh, if you like that uh, toolbox, we can add to it and make it better. But that's something that's up there now that was uh, designed with the hope that it helps you get started with this. Yep, excellent. Well, Dave, thanks. And I know that you've 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 held some forums on MS4 issues and I appreciate the leadership you've, you've had. And I, I think back to Drew Kleiss at San Diego talking about the value of asset management and how it can, it's the language that uh, the political leadership decision makers listen to. So Trey, to your point, that that's I think that that's very true. So I appreciate everybody's input. I wanted before we close, I'm getting some comments that saying the link that we've got provided does not work. So let me um, clarify that and I'll send in <laughs> the worst thing to do is put a link out there that doesn't work. So um, I'll follow up with everybody who's um, participated here, all attendees, and I'll clarify that. I think it's you might have to put an S at the end. Maybe it's webcasts. 
So if you guys want to try that, then that, that might, but I'll, but I'll clarify and I'll send a follow-up email to everybody. So with that in mind, we're a couple minutes over, but we're, I think we're good. Thanks for um, Dave. Thanks for Trey. Thanks for Lee. Thanks for Scott. And thanks for everybody uh, joining in. And then uh, I'm going to close up shop here and wish everybody a good rest of the week. Thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you.